Hello, so guys, sense. and welcome to the intellectual experience. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm just kidding. But um, I'm here with Frederick. You can maybe introduce yourself. Hello. Hi, my name is Frederick. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm myself. I'm a third year upper secondary student uh, who's just basically retired from a <laughs> youth political career, if you can even call it that. <laughs> Yeah, so, do, um, you know, I asked you, basically, so we made this podcast uh, in the summer, but the sound got, got all, like, corrupt and, and stuff, so this is basically, like, take two, right? Mm. But, so, basically, the last time, I was all about getting you to, into, like, explaining, you know, how the, how the youth... What what do you call it? Youth politics politics system works mm. in Bergen at least, right? Mm, yeah, how it works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I because was just, I was just wondering. Essential... Yeah, yeah. Go on, please. Mm, no, yeah. Um. So essentially, what I would sort of say is, uh, one of the interesting things that we've done in Norway is that we've recognized that there are some parts of society that don't even though we do live in a democracy then you could still say there are certain parts of society whose voices aren't necessarily heard to the same degree in the democracy so let's take three very concrete examples yeah yeah you have people who are too young to vote that would be the youth and they are uh, in order to make sure that they still have some form of a democratic voice a youth council was formed to allow them to still take part in the democratic process, even though not being able to vote. And then there's another part, the other council, for example, the Disabled People's Council of Bergen, which is you know, another group of people who, even though maybe many of them can vote, maybe some of them don't vote, or maybe it's difficult. Uh, and so therefore they also have their own council to help them be a part of the democratic process. And then there's a seniors council for people who are, you know, uh, on the on the older side of the spectrum to also allow them to feel as if they're uh, uh, a part of the of the democratic process. So that's that's something interesting that Bergen has done is sort of recognize these three groups as especially maybe put at risk of not taking part in the democracy and then doing everything they can to help them take part by giving them you know their own counsel and their own voice. Right, but what does that actually mean? Well, so that means that there's sort of a balance, right? Because they can't let, they can't give youth any direct forms of democratic power, because uh, just the way the justice system works is that obviously we're too young to make huge decisions that impacts people people's lives, and therefore we're not trusted to vote. However. Uh, even though that may be true, the youth perspective on certain issues is still very relevant. And so that's why um, they made a youth council so that even though certainly they don't want us to vote, what they do want, want is sort of hearing the youth perspective on certain things. So if they're going to take a, a topic uh, and let's say they're going to they're going to consider building um, a new playground for a school, then what, they, what they'll do is that they'll ask youth, or especially the youth council, you know, for their opinion about that playground. So even though we don't directly get to vote, they, they sort of include us in the democratic process through finding areas where they want our input. But then the <coughs> council of Bergen has taken sort of one step beyond that, and it's allowed its members to broach their own subjects. So... Uh, the old Youth Council of Berg Bergen has now been shut down, and in accordance with Norwegian regional law, it's been replaced by a sort of more of a city council that will go with um, a city government. But but the the principle still the same, is that at least to some degree, the the Youth Council is allowed to to decide on its own topics that it wants to pursue, uh, which which opens up for another avenue because politicians are you know usually grown-ups and so they're gonna have a different uh, experience of the world that's gonna lead them 
to consider the different topics worth working on. And so once you let uh, youth sort of decide their own topics to a larger extent, you're going to get a whole different set of perspectives and they might approach entirely different topics. Right, right. So so you're not getting power like you. The, the council is not getting power, but they are basically getting heard by the in office officials yes they're they're getting a, a certainly a, a seat at the table right and then um because because if you're a grown-up politician there's obviously so many cases for you to consider that it might be different to consider all possible uh viewpoints and that's what i think is you know the main purpose of these three councils is giving the youth viewpoint of the youth, giving the viewpoint of disabled people, and giving the viewpoint of elderly people. Uh, and and that, that plays out uh, with very real effects. Like one of the one of my main policy proposals that um, the grown up youth sitting the grown up city council was very positive towards and that I do believe actually became uh, specified in the in the regional budget for this year was that there were too few spaces, too few physical spaces in Bergen for um, youth to sort of spend time that didn't have a financial barrier hindering them from being there. So, you know, making sort of playgrounds, but for people who are old, too old for playgrounds, you know. <laughs> uh, but that was that was sort of uh, that's that's probably not something that some any grown up politician ever would have considered. Uh, or it, it, the thought wouldn't even have come to their mind. And so that's why I think it's helpful to have uh, the perspective of, of, of youth to to um, sort of come up with these ideas that else might never have been broached. Right. And, and you know, I, I'm really wondering because I've obviously gone, gone to, like, basically, I mean, not the same school, but I've, I've also gone to, like, school as you, right? And I know there's like a youth cons council in each school, but how do you get elected to this council? Excuse me, could you repeat the question? Uh, so basically, I'm I'm wondering how do you get into this council? Like, who decides who's in and who's out? See, because that's that's something that they've recently changed when they went from the old youth council to the new one. Uh, because there used to be one representative from each school being elected from the students themselves. Uh, but now what it is, it's that it's an application process where everyone within a certain age group, that's going to be um, from your eighth grade until you're 19, uh, can apply to join the youth council. And then uh, there's going to be a committee deciding who gets to join and who doesn't so now it's more of a gatekeeping process than it was because it used to actually be an entirely democratic process the youth council used to say to every single school in bergen that they want that a representative from that school and then that school got to have a democratic election for how or for for who they wanted to send but now what they've done is they've shrunk the youth council from around 57 members down to 17 members half of whom are, are um, vice representatives. So meaning that they don't have meetings uh, regularly. They only meet when the main representatives can't go to the meetings. Uh, and so they've shrunk it. Um, and that means that they don't have room for every school anymore. So now the process is entirely uh, application based. And, and I think that's an interesting proposal from them because it has both its positive sides and its negative sides because an application process is more fair if what you want to select for is engaged people, right? Because I know that you, for example, you go to one of Bergen's largest schools. So saying to your huge, huge school that, you know, you guys only get to send one or two representatives might be unfair because since you guys have, you know, a thousand students, maybe there are four super qualified people at your school who deserve a place. But then if the system has decided that only two people from your school can be allowed in, then that might might make it unfair. Uh, and so now, since it's an application, at least in theory, right, what's the, the people who are going to be allowed to join are going to be the ones who write the best application, which are hopefully the ones who are the most interested in the subject. However, uh, this might not always work perfectly because 
what about the, the reason why we had it from every school, right? Is because because then you make sure that you represent every part of Bergen, and and every every school and every you know area, uh, sort of by by forcing uh, to select one from each school. However, now some schools and some areas might be entirely un uh, w without representation. Uh, and another problem with that is that what we could see in the future, uh, I might come off as a lefty right now, but I mean, that's fine, I am a lefty. But what, what we could see in the future, right, is that the schools that have the most, um, well, how would you say it, that have the most resource, wealthy heavy schools with the most wealthy, yeah, <laughs> I was trying to say it a little bit more circumventive way, but yes, <laughs> the wealthier schools with the wealthier students who have more free time and who generally are more interested in politics. This isn't actually what I'm just something I'm just saying, by the way, it's a scientific report from the uh, prime minister's office in Oslo has shown that students from wealthier or wealthier youth are more politically engaged than otherwise, right? I mean, and that makes sense, right? You have more time to spend on entirely leisure activities uh, and yeah and the problem with that right is that what you might see is that the the, the schools that have students from you know poorer neighborhoods might get in the end less representation than for example i know your school has a lot of of wealthy students my school certainly has a lot of wealthy students so even though all the schools are free to attend you know i mean it doesn't cost anything to go to school but just because of the way that the socioeconomic climate is in Bergen, uh, it 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 would be very it would be very unfair to say, and I, I'm I, I'm going to ask if you agree with this, but I would I, I would say that it would be very unfair to say that there isn't a, some form of a class difference between schools, especially between you know lower secondary schools, because me and you go to upper secondary school where you know that's kind of it's a little bit better at our age, but the school below our schools, I would say that because that school is so largely dependent on the area of Bergen in which you live, there certainly are going to be socioeconomic differences between the schools. Right. And those differences are in turn going to show up in the selection process for this new youth council. Right. Uh, so, so, but um, which like system would you say uh, you you might have already said this but which one do you personally prefer so i got into a lot of discussions with this with my with my fellow um youth counselors mm -hmm. especially uh, with my boss or you know because i was um vice president of the youth council you were no and i got into two. a lot of heated discussions hmm? yeah i was number two <laughs> and i got into a lot of heated discussions with number one <laughs> uh, a very bright individual, but she she was more positive towards this new system. But I I was actually more positive towards the old system, right? Because I am very, or it, it's it's very it, it's it's perhaps more important to me that there is a fair representation of students than that anything is accomplished. And that might sound like the stupidest thing you've heard all day, but but humor me for a moment. Because I would rather have a less effective youth council, right? right? A less effective, like a worse youth council, a lower quality, that is selected entirely democratically than if I could have a super high quality youth council where, you know, only the 20 richest students got to go. Yeah, but where's Rick, Personally, basically? I would rather choose this to number one. Right. You know, you know, I so so I I was a bigger fan of the old system, but the the new system isn't terrible. Do you want to know what was terrible? Um, <laughs> there was a there was a draft system that was circulated. Now this wasn't official policy, so this isn't any politicians doing anything wrong. But one idea that was floated out there, right? This is the only way I can say this without getting in trouble. One idea that was floated was that youth organizations in Bergen would get to nominate a representative and that, that the youth council would be chosen from those nominated representatives. So what would that mean? That would mean that the local soccer team could nominate someone, the local debate club could nominate someone, the local chapter of the church could nominate someone, the local you know, uh, Red Cross could nominate someone, and that, that was the original idea that was floated. And I was adamantly 
against that idea because that would take you know the problems that I just outlined for for the system that we have now and make them ten times worse because what you would have then is that then you would have a large group of already disenfranchised people meaning the the youth in Bergen who don't take part in youth activities which the the uh, report from the prime minister office that I mentioned earlier, that report showed that students who um, who already were the students who already didn't take part in other youth organizations were also less politically active, right? So what that would mean is that those people that already had less of a democratic voice than normal, right, because they weren't a member of, 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 of youth parties, they would have even less of a democratic voice because now uh, the, the little youth representation that we do have would be selected via a process that entirely avoided even picking from their group. So this would leave out every all the youth in Bergen who do, don't take part in any youth activities, and they might be at the exact group that we need uh, to take part of in our system. So so that, that system is probably the worst case scenario. Uh, luckily, we avoided it. And personally, I, I did prefer the old system, one from each school. Even though, I mean, obviously that isn't perfect either, because, you know, if you have a school with 200 students and a school with 500 students and they both get one representative, that's not entirely fair, is it? Right. Yeah, you know, you know I, I honestly think that uh, there's, you, ha you have valid points, right? There's, there's good things and bad things with just about everything you, you've been talking about. So, so you know, you, you you talked a lot about income inequality, or like, I mean, that's basically what you were talking about, um, compared to who gets to, or like in relation to who who gets to participate in the new system, right? Yeah. Uh, but do you think that is, as uh, do you think that is? I, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm trying to say that we live in today's society where basically anyone that has access to internet can write a really good, like essay or um, a, a um, uh, God, I'm totally forgetting the word. Um, applying. Yeah. application yeah application yeah right yeah, oh, so God. To, yeah. The, to, to the council right yeah? right right so so like i do you think that the economic difference b would be like the biggest uh problem with the new system or like do you think that it is the biggest problem with the new system or is it like or, or is there any, any anything else i think this system is probably the the one that you know is is the new one right is probably better at negating socioeconomic differences because of the reason you say right but it's still not perfect right because right. one central tenant of the application is going to be do you have any experience and as i outlined earlier which group of youth have experience in politics it's already the rich youth or the the well-off youth so so that is going to to create to create a cause of problem right because you're going to have the rich youth who can brag about already being a member of a political party for five years before applying, and then you're gonna ha gonna have someone from a lower uh, social standpoint who might never have had the opportunity to take part in any political political organization before, and so uh, if you if you take experience into account, they are going to be disenfranchised. However, and this is a part where you know libtard lefty politics comes and saves us <laughs> because something that I've that I've not mentioned so far and that I was going to get into because I know this is going to rile you up so my good friend hold on to your seat right they have uh, a separate set of rules uh, or guidelines rather right for the committee you know I said there was a committee choosing and that committee is going to choose so that they try to get equal gender representation in the new council and equal geographical representation for the different parts of Bergen, which is probably also going to imply equal, you know, socioeconomic representation, because obviously, you know, different uh, classes tend to group at different parts of the city, right? You're going to have richer neighborhoods and poorer neighborhoods. 
So uh, I'm very interested in hearing your opinion about this because actually they do have guidelines that they are going to try to get like a as close to 50-50 gender balance and they're going to try and get an age balance between the different ages and different geographical balances as well. Right. So as, as far as I uh, un understood what you just said, you you were telling me that the council that picks the council the committee yeah, the, yeah. The, the committee yeah so, so sorry uh, basically they have to follow guidelines to um, fulfill criteria yeah they have, they have some have. some quotas they have to fill right right I every time I see this I I get I I mean there is a time and a place for just about anything so I I think that some guidelines could be beneficial but when they have guidelines like gender even socioeconomic or ge uh, um geog location basically every time they have th those type of guidelines i think that it can lead to some bad decisions right so I i'm give i'm i'm going to give you an example like for instance let's say that the 10 best candidates of them all right there, there are a thousand applicants and you get 10 that are really good and they're all girls right then you're like oh now i need to throw five of them away just because they're girls right it is it has nothing to do with like your ability your like how good you are or anything really just you were just unlucky to be the fifth best girls or, or the sixth best girl, right? Meanwhile, you were actually way better than the five men that got in. Right? And and kind of the, the same thing goes with it, location. Like, oh, I am better than two, the two people who got into the council, but just because I live here instead of there, that, that meant that I couldn't participate right and and in i i want to say like in certain scenarios they they could actually go again they can actually be counter quite counterintuitive right so where basically you wanted to get things even you don't get even at all, at all because the dude who is from that place is only there because there was nobody else from that place or like everybody uh had you had filled the quotas from this other location, which mm. contained far better people, right? Yeah. So, so as far as I, I mean, I do see that they can have in the back of their minds, like, oh, try and get it fifty-fifty, or try and like even the whole thing out. But as long as you have mandatory like quotas and you know different requirements, basically, I. I think that in the end, it's, it's going to be a lot of people that should have gone to the council were rejected and people that should not have gone to the council were accepted, right? So, so, yeah. So, I, I, I think that it actually makes more uh, problems than it does solutions. Yes, but uh, I would maybe a year ago or two years ago probably have agreed with you fully right however i don't anymore uh so i'll, I'll take them one by one right the first is there's a location right. the location is probably the easiest one to understand because what you notice when you work in the youth council is that you know it's always easier to fix problems in your own neighborhood like something that i've worked uh, at least in part with is is the the youth building that's built uh, uh called fisak right right but if i came from from some far away part of bergen i might not even know that that existed and so it would be very diff difficult for me to have any form of opinion about that uh without having you know the, the sort of the first hand experience so i think i think uh not I'm not saying they should balance it, you know, 100% fairly when it comes to what part of Bergen. But what I do say is that every every part of Bergen should be on the council. Because I know for a fact that I have 
almost no knowledge about what it's like to grow up, you know, on the opposite side of Bergen. I, I honestly don't know. I have no idea what it's like to grow up over there. And so, you know, in order to get the best possible youth council, it would be pretty nice to have someone on the council who grew up in that part of Bergen and who could be like, yo, uh, we really need more. Uh, we need really, we really need more playgrounds. Like there's no playgrounds where I live, right? If someone could come on the council and say that, that would be tremendous. But I don't think they should balance it completely. But the ginger one, that one actually, I think uh, I would like to have uh i'm not saying they should have 50 50 i'm not saying they should have quotas but i'm saying they should have uh, they should have it in mind and the reason for that is i'm going to give you a very clear example that's going to be entire almost impossible to argue against so i'm sorry but <laughs> i'm kind of unfair because I'm, i mean right. i sit on, i sit on all the evil knowledge here but one of the most important things that we did in the youth council right was one day they came to us and they were like yo the school like the bergen school system right they're making a new sexual education plan. Could you guys give us some input on the plan? Like they gave us like a many, many hundred pages long document and we're like, please give us some input on this plan. Like, what would you like changed? What do you like? What do you like better, right? Now, that part would have been impossible for us to do complete, that it would have been impossible for us to do a good job if we didn't have a split between boys and girls in that group, right? Because I, as a boy, have no clue what what is taught in in women's sexual education and i furthermore don't know as much about what should be taught in women's sexual education as i would if i was a woman and so i remember distinctly working on that group and i was like thank fuck thank fuck we're we're like uh, it was like we, we we were both boys and girls in the group like that was very, 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 very fortunate because if I like if 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 the if the if the Bergen uh, Bergen government officials came to me and asked for my opinion about the sexual education plans in Norway, I I could give a third of an answer, right? Because it's it's like divided into three. There's the education that both boys and girls get. There's the education that only boys get, and there's the education that only girls get, right? I can only answer questions about two out of three of those. And so I would need a woman to answer the last part. And so that's why I think they would need to have at least some representation of both of them on the group. And I think I think there's a lot of there's a lot of questions where they could get that, right? So if they're okay, Vili, let's say they're they're building a new uh, a new swimming pool in Bergen, right? And then they ask the youth council, like, yo, is there anything you guys need in the women's locker rooms? How the fuck am I going to answer that question? <laughs> I've never been in a woman's locker room, never in my life. How the hell am I going to answer? Right. So I need to have representation of both genders on the committee in order to actually be able to answer that question. And that's why I think the youth council needs to have uh, not not 50 50. No, 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 no desired percentage, just at least some members of both groups. Right, right. You know, I, I, I see your point and I, I don't know if they came out wrong what I just said but I didn't mean that I didn't mean that I wanted to like I, I mean I, di I didn't mean that there should be no uh girls like no boys on the council right I was just talking about when you but force they need rules fully. to ensure that but, but they have to force that's what I'm saying like they have to force because you can't have like let's say let's say one year right there, there's 17 there's 17 places on the council right let's say one year the top the top 20 best applicants are all boys, right? I mean, th theoretically, that could happen. Right. What I'm saying is, if that happens, you can't let in only boys. Like that, that can't. That that that. You have to have a rule that you have to let in some girls, even if they are worse applicants. Because if those 17 really competent boys got a question, gee, do you guys have any input on the on the women's locker room? There's nothing they can answer. Right. Yeah. You know, I I honestly see your point, and it's a. It is a really valid point. And honestly, I do think that you might have changed my mind slightly, right? Because, mm, yeah. So, so right, I, I, I could really, like, accept there being, like, a, even, like, a minimum amount of gender representation, right? But yeah, like but you need both. Presence. Yeah, right, right. But the second, but the second you go into like, oh, right now there is ten girls, and right now there's eight boys. 
now we gotta have two two more boys, right? The second you start doing dumb shit like that, that that's when I'll leave. You know what I mean? No, I I agree with you. I, then then I think we agree both completely because, right. and you know I I think I think it varies a lot uh, from circumstance to circumstance, right? So let me give you let me give you a very clear example. Uh, in Norwegian schools, in some lines of education, right? They're trying to make like quotas for both for boys and girls. And in many circumstances, I absolutely hate, hate it. And in some circumstances, I support it fully. So that might sound like a terribly stupid point, but but let me make it anyway, and then you can roast me afterwards if you want, right? <laughs> so in let's let's give some examples. Samples of, of the circumstances where I like that they have like gender quotas. There's two things that come to mind. There have been no three things. There have been gender quotas or two things. I say two. There's been gender quotas in the line for people who want to become psychologists, and there have been gender quotas in the line for people who want to, who want to become teachers. Now, even though I I agree with the points that you've already make made how on earth can i support these gender quotas like doesn't that go against what we already said well the reason why i still support them is because uh in those two professions especially it's important to have both men and women like for example i know that if i was a boy and i had had problems with my sexual life and i went to a psychiatrist i would very much prefer that psychiatrist to be a man that i could speak with my problems about right and I'm certain it's it's opposite if you're a woman that like you would rather have a woman to speak about your about your problems with. So in the example of a psychiatrist, boom, you need to have some of them. And teachers is even worse because they have proven that young boys respond better to male teachers. At least some young boys. Sorry, I need to be specific here. Some young boys sp respond better to having male teachers than female teachers. So if you don't select in a system in order to guarantee that you will have some of both. You're going to have a system that disenfranchises because of the gender, simply because some uh, some professions in some professions the gender of the person doing the job actually matters, and in some professions it doesn't matter. So I've had other other people right suggest you know gender quotas in things like science lines or like politician politician groups or like political parties, and I I hate all those subjects like. I think I think those are terrible ideas, but in certain circumstances, the gender actually does matter. Right. Yeah. 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 You, you know. You know. I honestly just agreed with just about everything you said right there. Right. So, so I mean, it, it is it is kind of unfair to to just make a i mean it's it's really not black and white it's not all black and white you have you have to look at everything objectively and you need to you need to think about everything as their own thing right so ex exactly the same thing as with the teachers psychologists and everything you said but it's 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 it still kind of goes against my values of enforcing things do you yeah, know what I mean? But I mean, it, it does go against your values. But it's I think still, in this circumstance, yeah. you have to choose the lesser evil, right? Right. Like, would you rather have forced, like, it goes against your values, you know, forcing some women to lose their place in the teacher's line because you have to let some boys in the teacher's line. You know, that goes against our values. But it would go even more against our values if a lot of young boys in Norway got worse education because they only had female teachers when they needed male teachers. Yes. Yes. Agreed. So it's like the lesser of two evils. Yes. So that's my that's my thoughts on the new uh, <laughs> the new youth council. <laughs> I think uh, I don't have much more to say about that. I think they're going to do a great job because it seems like we're getting more. The new youth council seems like it's getting more power. Hello. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Sorry. I my 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 computer just lagged for a second. Right. Yeah. And and. Do you have any more questions? Yeah. Uh, but the whole youth council thing. You said mm -hmm. that you were doing playgrounds for people that are too old for playgrounds right mm -hmm. and that you were getting i mean you're basically being this feedback machine for the politicians mm -hmm. you know i i've asked a couple of people who are on the council like oh what did you, what did you actually accomplish mm -hmm. and 
you know, I've gotten s answers to like a degree, but I, I wanted to ask you like, what have you accomplished and what did you want to accomplish being on the council? So I'm going to answer, yes, we've accomplished as much as you can reasonably expect youth to be allowed to accomplish in order to it not be unfair um, to, towards the grown-ups. Because, you know, obviously, since we're not old enough to vote, they can't give us too much power because that would be unfair to the people who are old enough to vote because we've sort of decided as a society that our brains aren't developed enough yet to make you know voting decisions and i know almost everyone in the youth council that i've that i've spoken to about this disagree with me 100 percent. they're like oh no we should let 16 year olds vote and i'm kind of like yeah, we should like when i was 16 i knew or at least in my you know my super ego opinion i i, I certainly thought that i was like you know uh, mature enough to vote and that i knew enough about politics to vote but that doesn't mean I trusted my classmates to do the same. Right, right. You know? So it's <laughs> like, even though I certainly feel like, oh, yeah, you should let me vote. I'm such a smart guy. My classmates, maybe not so much, right? But but have we accomplished uh, a lot? I would say yes. Because our greatest power lies in two things. The first is, you know, like the, the sexual education plan, right? If, the, if, 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 if I was fired from the youth council the day after I handed in, like, our sexual education thing, I would be happy because that's a huge thing that we got through. Like we got them to focus more on like um, setting boundaries and like uh, setting boundaries, like, you know, teaching young kids as, as far down as kindergarten, like this is my body. This is your body. I don't get to infringe on your body and you don't get to infringe on my body. Like we, we actually got to influence the, the, the new sexual education plan in a, in a, in a way that I thought was right. And, you know, it, that is a that is a pretty that is a pretty substantial step. Uh, and then the second part of the power of the youth council is we got to have input on the the budgeting of the grown-ups. And I actually, if, if you want, I can find them. But we had multiple points that we actually got them to to focus their budgeting on something that we wanted to. Um, there are multiple circumstances of that happening specifically. So so I would say yeah, that we did we did accomplish a lot. So you you managed to affect millions of kroners. Uh, if you want, I can check exactly how much. If you give me exactly one moment. I mean, I mean, it's it's not really important, but it was but, more uh, like, in, like in a general, cool thing to say. Yeah, like oh yeah, I I had an effect on the yeah. Budget. I mean, certainly, certainly, if you if you want to be, if you want to be nice about the money, right, and like attribute more money to us than you might otherwise, then yes, we certainly did um, manage to contribute or at least to help uh help redirect money uh towards where we thought it was more more necessary right yeah. um but but do, do you feel like there is wait, wait when did this all start has there always been a youth council or did it begin 10 years ago five years ago do you know and yeah Ten years ago, that was a very exact guess. It began ten years ago. Right. And... Uh, ten years ago, uh, they started it, uh, and it was, you know, ten years ago, it wasn't. You didn't have to have something that's new, uh, and so now because now in the new law, every single municipality in Norway has to have one, uh, and now they've also changed the rules so that you get you actually get paid for it, uh, because now in the new rule system youth politicians are treated as grown-up politicians, which means that they have the same rights as grown-up politicians, which means they have right to monetary compensation uh, the same way grown-up politicians do, meaning that they get paid per meeting they go to. So they also are corrupt. <laughs> so what do you mean by corrupt? <laughs> I'm just joking. But, but do, do you feel like there could be corruption in youth uh this youth youth council like there is in grown-ups council if you know what i mean mm, well there wouldn't be corruption in the same way because we don't have any voting power so the best we could do will be like to put forward an idea and then you know like getting paid to to advocate for an idea but then not even being able to vote for it so i don't think there's a lot of potential 
I don't think there's a lot of potential for corruption in the local youth parliament now. You know, that's, that's actually one of the things I wanted to ask you about was um, the corruption in politics. In politics? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. because what, I, uh... I, I just feel like I feel like there's like, like you know, everybody knows that there is corruption, right? But mm -hmm. I, I just I just don't understand fully like how the, all that works. You know what I mean? So this is a interesting topic, right? right? Because I, because... I'm I'm really dumb here, so I'm just like trying to, you know. Or, and I mean, it it depends very much on how you want to define corruption and how strict laws you want. Like, believe me, I am a lefty. I'm far on the left. So if, if if I was the one who got like to write the laws, right, and I got to define corruption, oh boy, a lot of things would be labeled corruption. So it really it really depends on how you want to define it. Like for example, right, especially in the U.S., politicians are allowed to take financial donations from companies towards their political campaigns, right? They're not they're not allowed to take money like into their pockets and go buy themselves a new car, but they are allowed to take money from from companies into their political campaigns and use those political campaigns to get reelected. And that is not considered corruption. That's that's entirely legal, right? But if I got to write the laws, I would definitely call that corruption and make it super illegal. So it, it really does depend on, on how you on how you want to define it. But but if I were to answer your question, right? I mean how does it happen? It happens because um, political power is maybe Political power, right, is maybe one of the power. I mean, all types of power are, have the opportunity to influence other parts. So, like, if you are the leader of a country, then your policies could affect the economy, and that economy could affect someone else's money, right? So, so technically, you have the power influencing someone else's money if if you wanted to, uh, and that really might inspire some people to use that uh, to use the political power. Um, to help others monetary gain, but then but then it gets down to like uh, you say that like okay everyone knows political political corruption exists but but I what I read from your question right is like but if, if everyone knows it exists why is it so hard to pinpoint well it's so hard to pinpoint because it's in so difficult to prove like it's ridiculously difficult to prove. let's take an example right right now in the U S you know uh, the have you heard about Joe Biden's son. Joe Biden's what? Could you uh, repeat? Could you repeat that? Uh, right now in the U.S., have you heard about the the presumptive Democratic nominee Joe Biden and his son Hunter Biden? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, for those who don't know, Hunter Biden, <laughs> uh, the son of the former <laughs> Vice President of the U.S., right? He is a prior drug addict who was discharged from the military and then all of a sudden or at least eventually he ended up working for a ukrainian oil company making fifty thousand dollars a month or a ukrainian energy company rather right right and if if uh, to to quote to quote Joe Rogan, if I was a conspiratorial individual, <laughs> I would see that as a conspiracy. But personally, I actually don't, because you know it depends on what you want to define as corruption, right? Because right now, corruption would mean that it, in order for them to get charged with corruption, you would need to be able to prove that somewhere along the line, Joe Biden said to the Ukrainian company. If you hire my son and pay him well, I'll help you guys politically, right? That that would be the way that you would need to prove corruption. But that, that, that probably didn't happen. Probably what happened, right, was Hunter Biden came there, on, uh, traveled to Ukraine, met with one of the leaders of the company and was like, I don't know if you know this, but like my dad is the vice president of the U.S. So like, I don't know if you hire me and we find any problems you know i'll just i'll just call my dad i'll just see what happens you know so so, <laughs> right. so because because you, you know you can't you can't prove that that's corruption you, you you can't prove it but the only thing you know is that if if hunter biden wasn't joe biden's son he wouldn't have gotten the job so then it's up to you 
is that is that is that uh, enough to define corruption for you you know i i i honestly didn't think that deeply into the question i was i, I was more on top of like what does it look like instead of instead of defining it but you know the more you talk about corruption i i think uh, it's really important to define it because then we can like come back like you know attack it or expose corrupt politicians or you know you, you need to have a solid solid uh you know solid grounds to build upon right mm. so that you can you know let's let's say that it was corruption right you need to have you, you need mm. to be equipped to handle that right yeah but do, do you have your own uh definition of corruption by the way i do but you're not gonna like it okay so you know the broadest possible way you could define corruption would be that corruption political corruption that's the specific political corruption is using your political office to get something that you wouldn't otherwise have if you didn't have the political of political office right but that definition is so broad that it can never be used. Can I give you an example? Okay. If the president or like if, if a congressman in the US is invited on an interview show, right? Why is he invited? Well, he is invited because he's a congressman, right? If he was just some Joe Schmo on the street, nobody would invite him. Right. So by my definition, that would be corruption because he gets invited. And if he, and if he wasn't a congressman, he wouldn't be invited. Correct. So by my definition, I mean, I honestly, in my heart, I obviously consider that corruption, but you can't punish him for doing that. I mean, that's just someone wanting to chat with him. But then, I mean, everyone would obviously agree that corruption would be taking money from someone because of your political political position and then uh, them expecting you to uh, give them something in return for that money. But then what American politicians who are corrupt in my opinion are going to say right <laughs> okay they're going to say like oh no i can take all the money that i want as long as i don't give them anything back it's not corruption but that's <laughs> that's honestly that is if that was true then fine but that's not how the world how the world works companies aren't going to donate large sums of money to your political campaign if they don't expect anything in return. Right. But then the corrupt American politicians, they might answer, aha, but the only reason they're donating to me is because I I'm not corrupt. Like I would be supporting, you know, fossil fuel industry, no matter if they donated to me or not, I would be supporting them either way, but now they just support me because I support them. But then you might say that, well, that is still corruption because the fact that they can give you money to your political campaign, right? That creates an incentive to to support their cause, not because you believe it's right, but because it has money behind it. And as soon as you introduce money into the political system like that, like I just outlined, then you've broken it. Because then the political system isn't anymore about who's right and who's wrong. And it isn't anymore about who can get the most votes. Now it's about who can garner the most money behind their side of the cause. So by that logic, climate change is lost because climate change or the fight, the, the fight against climate change, there's always going to be more money on the side of the oil companies than against them, right? So then that, that case is lost and, and we're never getting anywhere. Right. And, and then you also have lobbyism, right? Or like lobbying. Yes. So, but, but I consider a lot of lobbyism corruption, like, right. and, and, and technically I used to be a lobbyist, right? You know, <laughs> us youth telling the, the politicians what we, what we believe that they should do. Right. But I am very, very, very against any paid form of lobbyism. So this might sound weird, right? But I, I'm not, I'm not sure if you can define it as corruption. I'm not sure about that, but let's say that you have something super inconsequential. You have a store wanting to build, uh, build its store somewhere. And then you have, you know, the neighbor store, obviously not wanting that store to be built. Right. 
And so both owners, the owner of the store and the owner of the store that might be built, they both go to the politicians and they say, you know, they both proclaim their cause. Would you say that that, that arena is perfectly fair, right? They're both just going there, speaking their mind. That's, that's pure democracy. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. But then, right, what would you do if the, one of the stores hired, you know, a lobbying, lobbying company? Then all of a sudden they've shifted the, you know, the battle for the store, if you want to call it. Then they shifted that in their favor, right? Yes. So what is the other company going to do? They're going to hire their own lobbying company. But then something interesting happens. Then the store that has the most money to spend on lobbying is going to get the best lobbying firm and the most lobbyists. And in the grand scheme of things, is probably going to win the case more often than the other one. So, so in that system, right, which of the stores get to get their will isn't about which store should get their will or about what the politician thinks or even about what the people of the, of the surrounding area who get to vote think. The only thing that then determines which store gets built is which of them has more money to spend on lobbyism. And that's why I'm against lobbyism, because lobbyism does ruins the democratic process by introducing money as a variable into how decisions are made. When in reality, we should always be working. And I know this probably sounds like I'm a commie right now, but in my opinion, we should always be working to limit the amount or the degree to which money can have a part in how political decisions are made. Right. And, and you know, you're saying this as you're really against it, right? That, that That's the vibe I'm, yes, I'm, I'm, ca- I'm catching from you. Yeah. Against paid lobbyism. Yeah. But I th- also think that there is good things coming from lobbyism as well. Right? Because if not, it would be way harder to find cases that you might have not th- thought about, but now you know because somebody, you know, put that to your intention, put that in front of you, right? Yes. Lobbyism can, I mean, lobbyism can work on good cases. Right. But I don't think lobbyism can be a part of a fair democratic system because it it it, it creates, like, okay, as, as a raging lefty, right? What I want to do, like my, my ideal political world is a world where there is as little a connection as possible between political power and monetary power. Right? Okay. That, that, that's just my opinion. You, you, can, you can disagree with that all you want. So then for me, even if that connection is a good one, I still don't like it. Like for example, in Oslo, right? In Oslo, they lobbied for, that there was a good lobbying firm that, that spent a lot of money lobbying politicians to make uh, the center of the town car free like p- p- pedestrians and bicycles and scooters only but no cars right and personally that's something i like i mean that sounds like a great idea i, I would love if we could do the same in bergen make you know it impossible to drive any cars in the in the city center but they didn't convince the politicians to to make that so because they were right they managed to convince the politicians simply because they had more money than the op- than the opposing side had and that is that 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 deteriorates the democratic system yes yeah. you know i i honestly so, see see your point so i i preferably like the cases where i mean even even and you you could even make the argument that you know oh yeah but the the car people probably also hired lobbyists and they might have even hired more lobbyists but it, it really doesn't matter because ideally in the political system the discussion or the, the the decision should be entirely based on who is right right okay but obviously that's not always easy to know like we we're not capable of knowing which decision is the right decision so therefore we go for the next best thing and the next best thing is usually okay if we can't know what's right then let's just ask everyone who lives in town right you know in, in a democratic election let's just ask everyone and then they get to vote and then we go from there and that's you know that's the democratic system that's the that's the way that we do it right but then as soon as you allow lobbying into the firm then 
in the minds of the politicians. They're not only going to consider, hmm, what's going to be the most popular with the people, right? What's going to get me reelected? Which, you know, it's it's not perfect. It's it's not perfect that politicians have to try and get reelected, but it's not terrible either. But then they also have to consider, or at least they, they'll also be influenced by which sides is spending the most money. And that is going to make some cases uh, a lot less popular because not all causes are going to have big bucks swung behind them. And many causes are going to have more money against them than before them. Right, right. You, you know, I, 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 I see your point. And I also kind of want to know what you would want to, uh, you know, replace lobbying, per se. I want a system where the people can give closer feedback to their representatives. I want an open email that has... Uh, so, uh, you know, currently, right, in... Um, uh, in Norwegian law, if you get like, uh, there's a certain thousand amount of signatures you need to get, and then they like have to vote upon it in the youth, in the youth, you know, in the not youth, in the municipality uh, government. Have you heard about that? Uh, no. Okay, so in Norwegian law, if you want the, them to to make a decision on something, then you could get a thousand people to sign a petition, or maybe it's not a thousand, maybe it's a higher number, but you could get a certain number of people to sign a petition, and then by Norwegian law, they would have to vote on it, like. They didn't have a choice. They have to vote on it. Okay. And those systems, I, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm a very big fan of those kinds of systems, where the people actually can influence their, their politicians. So that's, that's a lot better way of doing it than, than lobbyism, because lobbyism can buy things that direct democracy can't, can't buy. Like, what are, are you going to go bribe a thousand people to sign your petition? Really? Because I, I, that, that gets very expensive very fast, and it's going to be a lot more expensive than hiring a lobbying firm. So even though, you know, that, I mean, you, you probably could bribe a thousand people, right? I mean, you probably could, but it's probably not going to be as easy. Yeah. So forms in which people can communicate with their representatives is a better way than lobbying, right? Like having like uh, every every representative has an email account, right? That anyone can send an email to, and you have to like sign with your, you know, your personal number and stuff at the bottom, right? Because it, it can't be anonymous because then people are just going to spam it, right? And right. then let's say uh, right now I'm just going from the top of my head, okay? So don't don't take anything I'm saying now seriously, but like this is just completely imaginary, right? You have an email account. Everyone who is like in their municipality, like that they're the representative of, they can send let's say one email per week maximum. And that email has to be answered within, let's say, two weeks. So that would be a much better way of doing it than lobbyism. Because then you take money completely out of the equation, if you get what I mean. But that would also be a lot of work to read all those emails. It would be a lot of work, but that's good work. Like, that's important work, actually getting to hear what the people think. So it would probably, be, it would probably take a lot of work and be super expensive, but that's fine by me. Like, I'm fine with things like that as long as we have avoid letting money influence our politics. Because you might say, oh, what, we're wasting money. Yeah, but we're wasting a lot more money by letting, you know, rich companies decide which policies get put through and which don't than by letting actual majority rule. You know, I... Like, if, if we were better at majority rule, things like uh, climate change would be combated a lot easier. Okay. Because if you break down into it, climate change is almost entirely, not, not entirely, but almost entirely, a battle between corporations and individuals. Okay. Almost entirely. Because corporations are... Listen, I'm not a commie, so I'm not saying that... I'm not, not against corporations as an idea, right? But they want to make, make money, corporations, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with... Like, corporations aren't people. That's, that's important to understand. That might sound like a really stupid point, but it's not a stupid point. It's a very important point. Corporations aren't people. So, so if, if corporate, if a corporation posts on Facebook, right, our number one and number two and number three goals is making money, making money, making money, right? Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. As a corporation, there's nothing immoral about wanting to make money. 
But if you're a person, right, your number one goal should be, I don't know, being a good father and your number two goal should be being a good friend, like, you know, things like that, right? So so there, it's, a, it's very different what is moral for a person and what is moral for a corporation. And corporations are by necessity incapable of committing moral actions because they have one goal and that's making money. And there's nothing wrong with that because we need corporations to make money to drive the economy. But, and here's the big but, right? Big but. Then, as a people, you have, <laughs> then as a people, you have to set limitations. Like, like, the economy is basically just a huge game of monopoly. Like that—that's literally what the game Monopoly was in, was invented to show. The game Monopoly was actually invented by uh, a leftist lunatic who wanted to show how easy it was to make monopolies. But then they changed it into more like a like a win win game. But but that doesn't matter. Okay. Like okay, imagine that the economy is a monopoly. It isn't. It isn't immoral for the companies playing Monopoly to try to win. Right. No. Like it's. I I can't blame them for trying to win, and you know. Uh, companies trying to get rich is what drives the economy. Like no one, I mean, or not no one, but uh, it's a huge, it's a huge incentive. Like if you could create a cure for cancer, right, you would be the richest man who ever lived, probably. Correct. If you if you create a cure for cancer that you could sell and like that no one could steal from you, you would probably become the richest man who ever lived. Yes. Probably. Maybe maybe not. Maybe Amazon. Maybe the Jeff Bezos guy would have more. But you would you would be ridiculously rich, and that's a very big incentive to create a cancer cure. So so there's nothing wrong with that. But then, what is another central aspect of monopoly? Of monopoly, right? Is that there are game rules. There's a there's a certain framework in the game monopoly that all the players have to adhere by, and that's that's where the democratic process comes in. Is creating a set of game rules where all the companies can act as selfish and terrible as they want because there's nothing wrong with companies acting selfish and terrible as long as we set very strict rules for them to play by this is going to be a lot more lefty podcast than it was last time i was i'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah it's cool right so so you know uh i i hate liberals to some degree okay I hate them. I hate okay them. I'm, I'm not liberal i'm on the left you're on the left you're not a liberal. pretty okay. far pretty far on the left okay and one of the reasons I hate liberals is they have the, – what I just explained to you, for some reason, they don't get it. For some reason, they think this is what we do need to do to solve climate change. We need to you know, convince every single company in the world that we need to save the climate. That's never going to work because, as I said earlier, companies aren't people. Companies don't have the, the same you know, humane drives that we people have. If a company knew that – like it could kill a, um, a coral reef and make a billion dollars, the company would do it every single time. That's how companies work. But if you ask a normal person, you know, would you kill a cat for a thousand kroners? Most of them are going to be like, fuck no. I'm not killing fuck, yeah. a cat for a thousand kroners. <laughs> okay, okay, you might say Easily. fuck yeah, but many Easily. people, okay. Would you, kill, would you kill a baby for a thousand kroners? Most people are going to say fuck no. Baby right? Hitler? But a company would probably be like, yeah, kill a baby for a, for a billion dollars. Of course I would, right? Yeah. So, but, and, and there, and you know, there isn't necessarily anything wrong with that because it's, it's a pretty good system, right? Where you have like a lot of companies, you know, competing against one another, trying to be the best, right? Capitalism. There's nothing wrong with that system. Cap, yeah. Do you want to, yeah. There's nothing, <laughs> there's, there's really nothing wrong with that. Well, it, it depends on how you want to define it because, you also could define it as market socialism, but it depends on how you want to define it. But yeah, yeah okay, a yeah. system, right, where companies compete with one another to try to make the most money. There's really nothing wrong with that. But you have to have a certain set of game rules, right? And in my opinion, right now, we have too few game rules. So right now, right, let, let me give you an example. It's going to be very lefty, and you're very much allowed to disagree with me and get into a huge fat in me right now. <laughs> okay. now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to Go say some lefty <laughs> shit right now. Go okay? on. We have, rules, we have rules in Norway that you're not allowed to have child labor, right? Okay. But we don't have rules in Norway that you're not allowed to buy things made by child labor. How the fuck does that make any sense? Yeah, it, it does not. It doesn't, because we made a rule, no child labor, because that's the right thing to do. But then essentially what our law says is, but no, no, no child labor is fine as long as you don't do it within our borders. 
what the flying shit do they mean by that <laughs> like that that is that that angers me so much is it rules like that like like we have as a society agreed that we we, we can't let child labor be a part of norway but then we let norwegian companies travel to bangladesh perform child labor and then bring the products back to norway and buy them right like we're literally just committing child labor but with like a small little plane trip in between but that's absolutely terrible but you you're also talking about norwegian law right mm-hmm. so it would be it would be way harder to, for norwegian law to enforce that elsewhere right so it would it so, would be very hard yeah. that's money i'm willing to spend like if we would have to spend you know a lot of money trying to save kids from child labor that's money well spent saving kids from child labor you know but even if, like what child labor like what do you mean do you mean child just working sweatshops in and... sweatshops in uh, asia okay you know i know close to nothing about this except like some general concepts right so are you talking about paid unpaid you know I'm uh, talking about perfectly paid, okay. paid child labor. Okay. Because the fact that it's paid doesn't matter. Doesn't the fact it that though? it's paid doesn't matter for the same reason that that having sex with a 14-year-old, it doesn't matter if the person agreed to it or not. If if you're you know a 30-year-old man. No, but if you're if it's because paid or not, because if basis... if it's not paid, then it's slavery, right? Like by nobody, de- nobody, it's, it's it's slavery. It's slavery either way. Just like it's rape either way, if if the if the thirteen year old agreed to it or not, it's still rape, and it's still slavery if they agree to it or not. Because the whole our the whole basis of our judicial system is that before you're eighteen, you're not capable of giving consent. And so you're not capable of consenting to working in a clothes factory before you're eighteen. Right, but but even here, people are working who are under eighteen. Yes. So or, or we 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 set the rules to like. I think it's 14 for some jobs, and then the more difficult and dangerous the job, we set it higher, right? So right, let's, okay. let's just set it at Correct. 14 as the cutoff. We've essentially decided that you're not capable of consenting to a job before you're 14. Okay. And so it doesn't matter if it's paid or not. If if an eight-year-old is working in Bangladesh, it's slavery, even if they're paid. Because the whole point of slavery is that, or at least not the whole point of slavery, but one of the concepts is someone needs or you can't sell yourself you can't rationally sell yourself into slavery okay that's that's not that's not something that you can do and so uh having uh someone perform child labor even if they think that they agree with it and even if they accept money for it since because of their age we can't be sure that they actually gave you know considered consent yeah, I, I, I see your point, but it, it, it's still better to, it, it's still like, I still think that it's kind of different if you're paid or not. Well, it's better if they're paid, but yeah. it doesn't make it anything less slavery. Like it's certainly better. I mean, it's better even if it was slavery, slavery. It's better if you treat your slaves good, but it's still fucking slavery, right? Yes. Yeah. So I, I think, I think, uh the reason i hate liberals is <laughs> they think that like making like anti anti child labor social media campaigns is going to change anything yeah or, well, it, and... it might change something in the next 200 years but i'm not willing to wait that long i want a law tomorrow that says and i quote you're not allowed to sell any product no sorry you're not allowed to buy or sell or profit from any product in norway that has in any way, shape, or form been created by child labor, even if that child labor was on the other side of the world. That I want that law tomorrow. I'm not willing to wait, you know, 200 years for for Bangladesh Bangladesh to post its own anti-child labor laws because that's going to take a lot of time. And I, I and I can't even blame them because obviously they think that it's like it's saving their economy and saving them from from being from uh, their their economy from doing worse, which seems reasonable from their point of view but if we in norway have a, have determined that we don't want child labor then we have to apply that rule consistently and we're not we're not applying it consistently 
we're, we're, we're essentially saying, you know, you can do child labor, just don't do it where I can see it. I just want you to pretend, I, I, I want you to pretend that you're not doing it. So please do it somewhere where I can't even see it. That's literally what we're saying. Right. So we're kind of claiming the moral high ground, but still getting the benefits yeah. of child labor. Yes. Would you and say then that's liberals fair statement? think that like making a social media campaign, be, you know, being angry, like hashtag boycott Hannah Woo! <laughs> like that, they think that's going to change anything. Right, right. And you know, you know, not I... to spoil their fun, but it's not going to change anything in the next, you know, a hundred years. Maybe after that, finally, they'll get some good labor laws in like Bangladesh and India and Pakistan, but it's going to take a lot, long while. You know, I mean, just, just think how long it took us. Like, it took us a long, a long ass time from the industrial revolution till we got child labor laws in Europe. It took us, took us hundreds of years. So if it takes Asia hundreds of years as well, which I mean, it might, there's nothing, I mean, they're not any worse than us. It'll probably take them just as long. Then we need to step up and refuse our Western money to go into child labor. Like, because remember, Bangladeshi child laborers aren't producing products for Bangladesh people. They're producing products like Norwegian kids wearing t-shirts and shit. That's what they're making. Yes, for us. Yeah, for us. And that's absolutely terrible. Like we're just hiding it on the other side of the world, like some old English imperialist. Like, bah, bah. <laughs> I don't like slavery. Put it over there, please. <laughs> you know, if if I, you know, this is this is the kind of thing that. Do you remember when I met Adam Woodway, the Norwegian Prime Minister, when I set a goal to basically ask her for a hike? Mm -hmm. Like, this is the type of thing that, you know, I should have asked for instead. <laughs> now, now that I'm looking back at it, <laughs> right? You know, I, I hope it made more, you know, beneficial to everyone. Yeah, but I don't think it's, it's probably never going to happen. Right, just, uh, I'm just living because of the goods. In a leftist fantasy. Right, is is that just because of the goods? Mm, it's uh, three reasons, maybe, or largely three. I mean, it's obviously uh, infinite reasons, but let's say let's take three big reasons. Okay. Big reason number one: lobbying. Hannes Amjöritz is going to take five billion dollars and putting into lobbying campaigns, right? And that's going to make a huge difference. Okay. So that's problem number one. Problem number two: Norwegian people want cheap clothes and yes. cheap phones and cheap furniture and cheap food and cheap everything and like literally if you said to a norwegian customer right oh you have to pay you know 200 kroners extra for this t-shirt but then it wasn't made out of child labor a certain percentage of the population literally is going to still pay the cheaper one yes like th that's how little people care if, if you get down to the bare bones of it that's that's why we had the huge ass uh boom pang uh, or uh, the huge ass uh um, how would you say that in English? Fuck. Uh, the huge toll? I don't know. <laughs> uh, uprising. Yeah, toll. Yeah. Uh, uh, road toll uprising of the last election here in Bergen is because if you literally tell people like, okay, you need to pay a couple of hundred extra kroners a month for us to include the city air. And then they're going to be like, fuck no, I don't want to include the city. I don't want to improve the city air for a couple of hundred extra a month. Give me those money back. Like, that, that's how we people are. We're selfish yes. idiots. Yes. Uh, and then uh, reason number three is people are liberals don't like the government taking action. Like they, they think it's like a government overreach, right? But us leftists, and you probably, or you might disagree with this. I don't know. I haven't asked you about this yet, but us leftists, you know, you know how they always say like, oh yeah, no government should know its place and not overreach and stuff, right? Okay, yeah, well, sure. What us what us libertarian leftists say is like yes, but that doesn't count to companies. Like I don't have as much against government overreaching if it's overreaching into the area of companies. Because that for me, in my head, that's literally just the monopoly game setting some rules. And that's fine, because else you would have a lot like there are some problems that government can fix and some that it can't. And this is one of the ones that it definitely can. Like, if the entire West, the entire first world, adopted that little rule that I outlined earlier, child labor would go to shit. Okay. Like, it would it would go so horrendously for it. Like, it would decrease by 
it's oh so much. I mean, I obviously don't have any percentages because we don't know, but it would go down oof. considerably. So, so that and that could that could literally happen like within two months, but we don't want to do it. Yes. And it wouldn't also kind of kind of have a huge impact on their economy, including our own, even because then products get get a lot, you know a lot more expensive, meaning that you can't buy as much things, right? Yes. So but... so it, it, would, it would still impact us and them negatively to, to a certain degree. It anyway. would not impact them negatively necessarily, no. Because the, the desire, the, the demand, to take it in economic terms, the demand for cheap goods from Asia, it wouldn't go anywhere. It, w it, wouldn't, it wouldn't decrease at all. Because even though the goods from Asia wouldn't be as cheap anymore, they would still be cheap because Asian workers are paid less than Norwegian workers. Yes, true. So buying clothes from them would still be a lot cheaper. And there's nothing like the, there's not necessarily much wrong with that. So the what would happen, right, is that everything would increase in price, but that isn't necessarily bad for the economy. And I know this might sound like some communist propaganda, right? But things increasing in price isn't necessarily bad for the economy. As long as the economy is stable, things can increase increase in price just fine. If you, you, do you get what I'm coming from here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, thinking because uh, I'm really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I on this topic I'm stupid too. Like this is obviously way too complicated for me. So I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be an economist. But right, it's 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 entirely unfair. To say that this would kill the world economy because how could it? It's just a product that used to be too cheap now returning to the price that it should be. So how is that going to ruin anything economy? I mean, I'm not. I'm talking about ruining economy. I'm. I'm just saying like there would be an impact. Negatively, okay. Well, it it might, but I don't see how it could that much because everything would increase in price by a certain percent, and then it would be over. Then it would just return to normal. And yes. then you know the economy would restructure around this new price and then go back to normal. Yes, but, but I'm mean, not an economy. economy. But I'm economy, just so. thinking it through, like my experience, right? You know, mm -hmm. I bought everything here, everything in my room, everything, everything that I've bought, I bought for a price, right? And yeah. you know, let's okay, let's take the iPhone, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sponsored by Apple, by the way. But uh, <laughs> so. My, I bought mine for like, let's say I bought mine for a thousand bucks. I didn't, but let's say that, right? Mm -hmm. I would never be able to afford that if it was two thousand bucks. Mm, if it right? was much more expensive, no. right? So then, mm -hmm. then that would mean that I would just pass and just keep my old phone or buy a cheaper one, right? Oh, how terrible! Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's not the problem, but the problem is then that would happen on a massive scale, right? So people would stop buying yeah. certain things because of the price, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I mean I, yeah. I'm 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 no economist or anything. This is just what I'm thinking here, right? So no, but that that is something that would happen. Yeah. What I'm saying is and so what? People buy less child labor products or people buy less clothes in general, which which might happen, right? I mean, people currently buy way too much clothes. Norway throws away an inordinate amount of clothes each year. Okay. So, yeah. okay, let's say we, we we buy much less clothes, and the, the clothing market is probably going to do terribly because of that. That's fine. Do you know why that's fine? Okay. That's fine because we need to change our culture away from overconsumption if we are going to ever be able to fight climate change. This is this is self-evident for yeah. anyone who considers uh, what is polluting. Like, do you want to hear reason number four hundred and fifty-nine? I hate liberals. <laughs> sure. I hate liberals because <laughs> they think that they can fix climate change by, by shouting, doing, or yeah, by chanting. But that's not why I hate them. I hate them because they think they're gonna solve it by doing like I'm gonna do some lifestyle changes. I'm gonna like recycle more and I'm gonna like eat healthier and no. No 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 no. You could eat like a pig and drive the most gasoline heavy car that I've ever seen, right? You could drive like a huge ass Hummer, right? Yeah. But if you bought like 
a couple of less phones a year and maybe one less phone, then you're still going, then you're still probably doing more for the environment than a liberal who eats only like grass for the entire year, but then <laughs> buys the new phone. Right. Like, right. I mean, obviously this isn't an exact example, but the point that I'm trying to get across is that liberals underestimate how much pollution comes from buying new products. I think okay. uh, a friend of mine recently, uh, he's an actual commie though, so take <laughs> okay. his words with a tad of... Uh, oh, he's an actual <laughs> okay. commie. Like, not okay. a, take his words with a grain of salt. But he explained to me recently how if you had, uh, let's say you had one person who lived like, uh, who lived a normal life, right? Like just a normal life uh, in his car and his house and just lived a life eating meat, going to work every day for a year. But then... In that year, he didn't buy a new phone and he didn't buy a new car. He just lived his life, right? And then let's say you had another person who had net zero emissions. Like let's say he was homeless or something. Like he, he, had, he had zero emissions. But then all of a sudden one day, he went and bought a brand new car. Which one do you think polluted more that year? It's the guy who bought the new car. Okay. And that just baffled me. But but it, it's true. It's the, the consumption is what's really going to kill us eventually. Because because we can try to effectivize all of our con, all of our small consumptions as much as we want. But the, the, the consuming of new products is what is really going to kill us in the end. Because that pollutes so, 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 so much. That's actually... I mean, I don't know enough so about he's... this, but yeah, I, I, I can see your point, and I can also agree to at least what I know <laughs> about what you just said, you know what I mean? So so mm. you're basically... But as, so, so, can, can, so I, can I just say this, please? Rules. Yeah, sorry. Right, so, so sorry. You're, you're saying that people are underestimating the um, impact of buying new things that new things have a way greater impact than eating grass would. Mm -hmm. is, 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 is that correct? Or am I just misunderstanding yeah, you? Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Right, okay, yeah, sure. Okay, go on. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, if setting strict ground rules for the economy would decrease consumption, then thank fuck. Like, we're going to have to decrease consumption for it sooner or later and so if we want to do it this like i think i think if, if we want to switch it a little bit more into climate change because that's probably one of the topics that i'm most interested in right okay. uh and also it's going to help sort of make the this discussion a little bit more global minded than just discussing you know local politics in, in the city of bergen but sure something that i think it's it's interesting to realize right is uh, in the fight for climate change, or in 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 every in any movement trying to make social change, there are there are stages of the movement that you need to pass through, right? Okay. So, the first stage of climate change was realizing that it was happening, right? Three hundred years ago, no scientist had ever heard of climate change, and you need some time for scientists to gather the data and find out. Oh shit. Something is happening, right? Okay. So that's, let, let's call that stage one. Then, after scientists were sure it was happening, stage two is convincing people, the masses, people that it's happening. Like, right. Yeah, convincing, just convincing people. And that was like, you know, Al Gore was one of the first politicians in the US. You know, the Norwegian Green Party is getting more and more voters, like stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Let's call that stage two. But then, stage three and stage four are probably even more interesting, right? Because then, Here's even something that's, that's even more difficult than convincing people it's happening, is convincing people that something needs to be done. And do that's something. stage three. Right. But then, but then even convincing, but then even more difficult, right, is stage four. Which is doing Convincing something. people that some, no, no, that's stage five. Okay, right, okay. <laughs> stage okay. four is convincing people that something needs to be done quickly. No, right. And that's that's that that's the one that we're struggling the most with, okay. right? Because the, the UN has li the the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, has literally told us that we have until 2030 to decrease emissions by 60 percent. Okay. That's 10 years from now, and we need to go down by 60 percent. 
that is a ridiculous amount to ask for in 10 years right so 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 when when people in uh, the in right wing parties say like oh yeah i believe in climate change and then right afterwards they say oh but i don't believe we should do this 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 or this then it's like do you really though like do you really believe in climate change if you're not willing to do anything and moreover you're not willing to do anything more quickly like do you know one of the stupidest things i heard the other day was right i heard the leader of or the it's called a ceo right okay. i heard the ceo of equinor the huge norwegian oil company he said on live radio that he realized that eventually we were going to have to stop producing oil right really so hmm. he is at, <laughs> so he's at stage three if you know the discussion we just had right yeah yeah he's at stage three he realizes that something has to be done, but he's not at stage four because he doesn't realize that something has to be done quickly. Like, it's not like we have a hundred years to do this. We have 10. We have 10 years to do this. We have 10 according and he was to... speaking as if, according to the IPCC, the right. UN's International Panel on Climate Change, which is the un undeniable largest authority on climate change in the world. Like, right, okay. there, there's no higher authority than the, than the UN's International Pi Panel on Climate Change. Okay, so, so, so he's on stage three, acknowledging that something has to be done, but then he just ignores stage four by saying that he's, like, he's still gonna be the CEO of a massive oil company, and he realizes that something has to be done, but he's not saying something has to be done now. He's like, oh, eventually something is, is going to have to be done absolutely baffles me people like that but then again his job kind of relies on oil yes his job does rely on oil which i judge i but i mean i judge him for that as well you know i mean for me that's like being like a war profiteer like he's he's profiting off of the world going to shit and i know that i couldn't live with myself if that was me that's correct but if you don't do it then somebody else would right and that's I yeah, mean, I mean, then, what then I just I'm said is a really stupid me mentality as well, but it is it it is still a real point, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, someone is going to do it anyway, but that, that's why we and and I and just like you know the discussion earlier with the, with the, with a monopoly game, someone is going to do it unless you change the monopoly game rules so that it's impossible to do. Yes. Right. So we need to make a, 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 an uh, impossible, like a monopoly game rule, like every company has to put forth a plan to decrease its emissions by 60 percent before 2030, else they get shut down by the government. Like something we, we, we need. I mean, maybe not something that extreme, but we need something extreme like that because we can't just expect the companies to do it on their own. There needs to be some game rule forcing them, forcing their hand because they're not going to do it by themselves. They have no reason. They have no reason to do it by themselves because, as I said earlier, companies aren't people. Companies don't have the same the same priorities as we do. So the the thing that's making me not a commie is that I like the companies, right? Okay. <laughs> but the thing that's making me a lefty is that I want very strict rules concerning how the companies can play, like how they can play Monopoly, which 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 way they can play it. Damn. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, you know, the more that I talk to you, I just realize that I'm stupid. I, I, I care about these topics a lot. Yeah, I really do. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's probably because my dad is a climate scientist, so it's like, or, I mean, you get kind of, yeah, you're start kind of working pushed. early, like you start caring about these kinds of things. Yeah. yeah, you get pushed. You certainly do. Uh, but then I want to I want to ask you a question. Right. Uh, what do you think about Greta Thunberg? <laughs> well, Greta, Greta, Greta. Right. Okay. So, Greta Thunberg, as uh, Rick Jarvis said, uh, I th I think that you know her cause is what I would say um, noble. It's a fairly noble cause, but. And there's a huge but, by the way. I think mm -hmm. that her being young and, you know, just all of, like, her, the package, if I'm going to use that word, for lack of a better term, I, I just think that 
she's easily used or manipulated or, you know, just taken advantage of, right? And I also think that it, 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 it's really hard, this, but I I think that she's definitely doing something, right? But I, I think that, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to discredit her because of her age. I mean, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm going to do that. But, uh, but, you know, her being so young that, I mean, I mean, I, this might not be true, but I heard that, you know, the first time she heard about climate change, she just basically went on strike and that's, and the rest is history, right? Mm-hmm. I just, I just think that we need more people like her, right? But we didn't, we mm-hmm. don't need more 15 year olds not going to school. We need more people like her that are actual politicians in power, right? And that are also educated enough to take to basically take action that would not cripple the economy or like cripple or like basically do more harm than good, right? Even e- even though the good is saving the planet, right? So so well, what one thing about is, you know, are you really able to not produce Okay, let let's say we were to stop producing oil, right? Tomorrow, like nobody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm no economist, but I would think that the economy would just, you know, go to sleep, right? It would go to shit. <laughs> it, would, it would just go to sleep and just never I'm wake not up. Saying, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying it wouldn't. It would. Yes. But it gets to a point where it's like, yeah, and, like. If, if, I mean, we in Norway, we're in a very special position where we have yes. the capabilities or we have the oil fund that might help us fund a transition into renewable energy. Yes. Um, and even if the economy does go to sleep, you know, it it's still the lesser evil because... The other one is death. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not, 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 I'm not saying the world is going to go under, but it's like, we are... It's it would be an absolute failure of humankind if we destroy failed. the planet. Yeah. It, it... If 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 we if if we if we stagnated at stage three. Yes. Like we got to stage three. Uh, uh, like, let's say like eighty percent of Norwegians believe in climate change and believe okay. that something should be done, and then we just stopped. Yeah. We didn't actually do anything. Like more people kept voting for the Green Party and shit, but nothing actually happened. Nothing substantial. Like that would be that would be a massive testament to the failure of humankind if, if we never actually manage to get anything done, even when we know everything we need to know. Yes, and, like, and, and that's why we're I not, was We're not talking waiting about... for any more research. We know what we need to do. Right, and, and, and that's why I was talking about, like, we don't, in my opinion, we don't need more people like her. We need more people. I mean, we need more people like her, but not, we do not need, you know, a couple million teenagers that are just protesting, right? We need, we need people in power we're taking action. Yes. You know what I mean? But I think I I'm a bigger fan of the protesting than you are probably. Yeah. It's probably true. But that might be because I'm more of a lefty who believes in strikes. But I mean if the government isn't going to do anything to meet those 60% goals by 2030, then eventually there's going to have to be strikes to get it done. Yes. Maybe school strikes, but probably. But I mean, I would agree with you that a general strike is probably better than a school strike. And then... You know, like a proper old school communist general strike. <laughs> like, we're not opening factories till you guys ban oil kind of strike. Right. Like an ultimatum. Or like ultimates. I, I, th- I think. Yeah. Yeah. Like a proper old school communist strike. I mean, obviously not becoming communists, but like, in the same spirit. Yes, but 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 all, I mean, I mean, if if we're going back to like Greta Thunberg, yeah, but but mm-hmm. but the, you know, 
would people really be able to handle no oil? Would we really would we really be equipped to deal with the world without oil? Like, okay, let's let's I mean, say I mean I I can give an example on what I'm thinking about, right? Mm-hmm. You know, every people every person on Earth needs food, right, and water. Mm-hmm. As far as I can tell, like the food and water supply are basically reliant on fossil fuels, right? Because you gotta you know take the crops ship them off to this place and then ship them off to the store, right? Mm-hmm. So if if there was no more oil tomorrow, there would be, you, you, you'd have mass starvation, right? Or, yes and no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I, 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 do, I do realize that I'm stupid and I'm, I'm just saying this like an idiot. No, no, but idiot. I'm, because I'm not, I'm not... I'm not calling for mass starvation tomorrow. Yes, yes. Like that, that it wouldn't, it wouldn't be worth saving the world if, if millions of people are going to starve. That's, that's, that's not what I'm saying at all. Yeah, but, but the, uh, the, 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 the thing that I am trying to say that is, if we reduce our th- like emission by sixty percent, right? Mm-hmm. Would be, would we be able to handle that without, you know? Basically, being that yeah. is the reason for people to die, right? Do you know what I mean? It, it's it's probably stupid to anybody that's educated in this, but that's just what I'm thinking here. Like, are we actually like technologically able to live with that oil for now? I'm I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb and say yes, because uh, currently a couple of reasons. Firstly, okay. the we're not pooling our resources effectively enough as we should. Okay. We're not building enough solar. Like the second example, we're not building enough solar panels in Africa. Yeah. Okay. We're not. We're, we're not even close. We're not building enough uh, enough hydro power plants in the Himalayas. We're, we're not because there isn't money for it. Like the Himalayas isn't covered. I'm just saying that as an example, obviously. But like the the huge ass, you know, Himalaya mountains aren't covered in hydropower plants like they should, because no one has had the money or the care to go and make them yet, because it's not profitable enough. Okay. And we haven't made we haven't made solar panels in Africa because it's not profitable. It's much more profitable to go into the Sahara. Af- Af- it's much more profitable to go to the Sahara Desert and dig after oil than it is to go into the exact same Sahara Desert and make solar panels because solar panels are expensive as shit. And they're they also they, they, very they really inefficient. Uh, and, so, and so that's why I'm saying we need to take the strict action, right? Because as, as soon as we set the game rules that we say, okay, from now on, or five years from now, you can't profit off of oil anymore. You okay. have five years to switch to switch all your assets away from oil from now. Ready, set, go. Like, come on, go get them, right? <laughs> After those five years, then it's going to be profitable building solar panels in Africa. Then it's going to be profitable building hydropower plants in Himalayas. But reason number 569 that I hate liberals is because <laughs> if we don't, no, really, if we don't set that, you know, five years from now, you can't make oil anymore rule, it's never, 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 never going to be profitable building, you know, covering all of, all of, uh, all of uh, Algeria. It's never going to be profitable covering all of Algeria in solar panels. Because it's much more profitable going to the next country over and digging for oil. Yes. So it's it's never going to happen unless you set the game rules to a certain standard. So I, I think it is possible. But the only reason, the only, and I, and I understand why you, where you're afraid that it isn't possible. But the only reason you're afraid it isn't possible is because we haven't forced the game rules to change yet. Like, if, if if you knew that eventually, or like uh, five years from now, oil was going to be illegal, then I'm sure you, or at least I would hope that you would agree with me that eventually it's going to be profitable covering Africa in solar panels and covering the Himalayas in, in hydropower plants. Okay. So eventually we're going to, like, if we set this, if we set the game rules strict enough, eventually, yeah, eventually we could just snap our fingers, turn off the oil tap, and we would live fine on. I honestly believe that. You know, you know. Also talking about game rules, right? 
what 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 you just said, mm-hmm. right? But but that the game rules has to be set to make it profitable to uh produce solar power, wind power, mm-hmm. water. I, I don't know. Uh, but what if? Do you think it's possible to just you know not demand that they reduce their emissions by sixty percent, but kind of t- twist it in a way so that it becomes way more profitable to be uh to use solar power for instance right just take that as an yes. example do, do you think that it would yes. be i mean that's what i'm thinking that as long as it's more profitable to go the green way if you know what i mean it was it would always it, it will always like you know work do you know what i mean i think i think that's i think that's very very possible but I think it's, or at least I think one of the things that you have to be afraid of, right, is the, the way that, the easiest way you could accomplish that would be a carbon tax. Okay. It would be a logarithmic carbon tax, uh, meaning an, an exponential carbon tax, meaning that the more uh, CO2 you or your company produced per year, the more expansive each kilogram of CO2 became. A logarithmic, an exponential graph. Yes. For how much it costs. Yeah, yeah. I know what you that mean. would be the way to do it. But what is the problem with taxes? The problem with taxes is you can ev- Norway doesn't get to decide its taxes. Because if we decide on a logarithmic tax, uh, carbon tax, and Sweden doesn't decide on a logarithmic carbon tax, guess where all the oil companies are switching to, at least as much as they can. Yes. Right? So so I think it's... I, I think I, I'm... I'm going to say that it's probably it probably is possible to do it the way that you suggested now, which is making it more profitable to to go clean. But then every company, would, then every country in the world would need to do it. Yes, every everybody would need need to play along. Yes. We just just. But then you can make the same rules that we made earlier. Like you can't, you know, sell a product in Norway that wasn't produced with green electricity. Like then you, then you could do it like that. Like we like we discussed with the child labor laws earlier. Yeah. So it it's it's really like do you, I do not really see an end to this like in the near future, right? Do you, do you see that oh like tomorrow there's going to be no solution or like this new phenomenal technology no. is going to save us, right? No. Because I am not I seeing don't. that as well. I don't because um the problem of climate change points to the very problem of Humanity. how industry is is created. So let's let's take two different existential problems and let's contrast them, right? One of the biggest problems that we first arrived at uh, in the, I believe this was the 70s. I could be entirely wrong. You just have to excuse me for that. <laughs> Do you, right. you know when we learn in school about, about those, uh, those carbon chloride gases yes. that can reduce ozone that can reduce ozone in the atmosphere yes they weren't or they were as okay they were as dangerous as climate change probably okay yeah but they were a lot easier to fix than climate change like it almost took no effort to fix it we just needed to you know flip a switch and instead of using carbon chloride carbon chloride gases we switched to you know whatever some other gas right Yes. Like it, it was really that simple because our technology allowed us to just change out one chemical with another chemical. I, I know I'm oversimplifying, but you, you, I have to oversimplify because this isn't a, this isn't a science. Uh, this isn't a science lecture. This is just a political discussion, yes. right? So in that in that instance, all we needed to do was flip a switch and switch from one chemical to another chemical. Climate change isn't like that because climate change points to the fact that in industry. What we do is that we take a fuel and then we use the fuel to create something we want and we have some waste created, right? Obviously. But then what climate change says is that, no, we need an entirely new system where we don't create any dangerous waste at all because that's going to ruin the planet. Yes. And that's a much more difficult problem to fix than just switching a chemical, you know? And and even like technology... That's meant to be, like you know, green, like environment, environment, 
Tilly friendly, I think. It, mm-hmm. it th- that even produces sometimes dangerous waste. Mm, yeah. Right. For, for instance, like same. cars and the the batteries, for instance, like you know. Mm-hmm. So, so even though, let's say everyone switched to electric tomorrow, right? There, there would still be. You know, every product will still be used. Every product will still be produced by oil, right? There's a whole lot of products that basically nobody thinks about is produced by oil, right? Even like shampoo is is oil is in shampoo apparently. I th- I think anyway, right? And okay, let's say, but back back to the point. Let's say everybody changes to electric. You're still gonna pollute while producing the car, right? You're also gonna pollute the battery. Getting the, the the getting the materials, everything around the product is producing dangerous waste, but not the product itself, right? So absolutely. So so even though we find this new te- technology, there would still be we would still have to have technology that could supply that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So if it would. What I'm saying is, it wouldn't necessarily help all that much if everybody switched to electric, because then you would have to produce more batteries. You'd have you'd have to have to produce more cars, right? Because every car now is fossil fuels. I mean, not every car, but a lot of cars, right? So you you would have to scrap the old ones and then make new ones, right? Which would just be even worse, at least to some extent. Yeah. You know what I mean? So now. So now you just outlined reason number 612 why I hate liberals. It's yeah. because uh, the people that think that switching to electric is saving the environment are idiots. Switching to electric isn't saving the environment because the whole premise of saving the environment is that we can't live in a world where everyone has their own car. Yes. We can't. Like there, the, the, the an amount of pollution that arises from producing cars currently maybe maybe like a thousand or like a hundred years from now we'll have fixed it but like we can make like i don't know fucking wooden <laughs> cars that go on hydrogen gas or something fancy right, like that but right, no, yeah currently right actually there are there are cars that go on hydrogen it's pretty cool but yeah anyway not to get distracted um even in even if in theory we could eventually make wooden cars that go on hydrogen right now we can't and so right now because of the let's, let's call it the carbon price of making a car the carbon price of making a car times 7 billion people is too high. That's more than we can afford. Yes. So we need to have, do you know how many people can fit on a bus? Like 50? I think. I don't know. Yeah. So let's take the carbon, the car, that, that carbon price of a car and then divide it by 50. And then multiply it by 7 billion. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can afford that. And then how many people can, can, how many people can fit on a train? A hundred? Or 200, we divided by 200. Okay, now it's much more reasonable. So you know, and, and then and then walking, and then it's completely free, right? So we're we're gonna have to think more like that because liberals just think that they can, you know, I, I've seen a lot of interesting tweets <laughs> when it's like liberals think that they can fix climate change by my by buying more shit. Yes, which and is I think that's so funny. Yeah, but they think so. They think, oh, I'm, I'm gonna start buying green clothes, and I'm gonna start buying a nice electric car, and I'm gonna no, no, you're not. <laughs> They, like a lot of people think that they want to fix climate change without being willing to sacrifice anything. And I'm not saying that sacrifice everything. I'm saying nothing. They don't want to sacrifice a thing. And that way, we're never getting anything done at all. And you you know this problem with not being able to. Uh, I mean, not. I don't know, wanting to do anything. I mean, you want to, but not doing anything, right? Have you have you experienced that firsthand by politicians when you've been in the youth castle? Yes. Yes, I have. Um, and do you see any way what? to fix that? Um, well, in climate change or in general? Uh, I'm talking about you know the politicians, the people in power, right? But but about about climate change specifically. Uh, 
but anything really. Okay, be yeah, because because I I've seen this happen a lot of times. What usually happens in the youth part council is like the politicians will say like, um, oh yeah, no, we like your idea, but hey, it's too expensive. We're not going to do it. Yes, right. Or, or 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 they'll be like, yeah, but you know, we we can't prioritize that right now. Um, and so I I think we do see it a lot where they'll recognize problems, but then they're not willing to go for the solution because every solution comes with a price, and that's not a price they're willing to pay. Which is also and how kind to of a problem here, well, right? I think um, I'm not sure if it is possible to fix, because what I see as a perfectly reasonable problem, some other person might see as a totally unreasonable, crazy person idea. Um, so convincing politicians to, or I mean, it's it's always difficult to know when someone is biased and when someone just has a differing opinion like yes. because i could sit here and say like oh yeah no all politicians are corrupt they're all paid off by lobbyists but maybe many of them probably aren't so it's i i don't think i i don't have a solution for that i'm just gonna say i don't but what i do have a solution for because and the reason why i asked you about climate change specifically is we need to change our mentality on climate change, which is one of the reasons I brought up Keta Thunberg, because yes. I personally like Keta Thunberg in the sense that she is angling the fight towards climate change towards something else. She's angling it towards we need to do something, right? She, she's certainly in stage four. She's yes. on the we need to do something train, and that's good. We, we need we need to fo angle it more on that, and we need to convince our politicians to go on stage for as well, and we need to tell our politicians that you know, saying that we need we need to to combat climate change eventually isn't good enough. Either you give us a plan of how you're going to fix it in ten years, or we go vote in someone who is, right? I mean that that's sort of the mentality that I, th that I think we need to harbor. So I think that that we should be a lot better at questioning our politicians specifically about their specific plans and how they're going to target climate change within the, the short time frame that we've been given by the IPCC, uh, instead of just accepting that when they say, oh, yeah, no, I believe in climate change and I'm taking the topic very seriously. Because if I don't see any direct proof of that, I don't believe them. I'm going to say something a little bit controversial now. You're going to maybe get angry with me or maybe not. But, <laughs> okay, but go on. <laughs> I don't, I, I believe that the amount of people who believe in Nor who believe in climate change in Norway is probably way lower than you think. Okay. Because saying that you believe in something and believing in something are two entirely different things. Yes. Have I you agree. ever in have have you ever in your life been in a situation where you hear some people discussing something? Like maybe they discuss a new Star Wars movie. Okay. And you didn't like the new Star Wars movie, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, what did you think about it?" And then you don't want to get into like a big discussion with them, so you just say like, "Oh yeah, that no, was fine." And then you know to just move the topic along. Yes, that's what I think a lot of politicians are doing. Yes, just I don't think it off. they actually believe in pile in climate change. I just think that they, they 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 say they believe in climate change to get the topic to move on so that they can avoid it. I I don't think that almost any politicians, right of center, and in the Labour Party in Norway, actually believe in climate change. And it's a very controversial statement. But the reason I'm saying it, Philip, the reason I'm saying it is because you can't get me to believe that if the IPCC says that, you know, 99% of all coral reefs are going to die if we don't decrease emissions by 60% by the time of 2030. And then if you hear that statistic from the IPCC and you're not willing to do anything to fix it, then you don't believe it. I don't believe that you believe, you know, like you can say that you believe in climate change, but if your house is on fire and you're still, and you're still sitting at your dinner table, eating dinner, you don't believe in the fire. <laughs> you don't, you can pretend that you do, but if you're not actually doing, you know, the reasonable thing, which would be getting the fuck out of your burning house, then I, I, I don't believe you when you say that you believe in climate change. So yeah, no, I, I don't think a lot of politicians believe in climate change. I think they just say they do, 
or they just pretend they do. Or maybe, maybe if we want to be nice, maybe they themselves think that they believe in it, but that they just believe in it in the same way that like, I believe that uh, some, you know, uh, some chemicals in the food might be bad for me. Like some people have told me sometime and I think it's true, but I'm probably never going to check it or do anything about it. So it's like, meh, you know, think like that. You know, I, I only think that it's also, if you take the burning house, right? Mm -hmm. It would be really stupid to not run out, correct? Mm -hmm. But what if, you know, your house is so big that you don't even see the wall? You, you don't even see anything, right? you, you know, it's just empty room, right? And then it's burning. And I, 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 th I think that this might sound stupid. It sounds pr pretty good in my head. That the, the, pro the problem is kind of so far off. You know, I am not feeling anything of climate change, right? I'm not affected. At least I don't think I'm affected, right? Yeah. I, like, my, my, my house is not getting flooded tomorrow. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Right, and mm -hmm. and I, but I still believe in climate change, right? Mm -hmm. right. So I, I I think also that's a really important thing to, to point out that you might people might just underestimate or like you know just think about other things that are more. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. Like it 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 goes way. It, it it's not on top of the priority list. Okay. Because Absolutely. it's not Absolutely. immediately important. Or it's it's not easy to wrap your head around. Yes. Right. So I, I mean, uh, I mean, so, so, so a, it's basically way easier to to let's say it's climate change and you you gotta fix police brutality, right? Mm -hmm. It's probably gonna be stupid, but it'll be way easier to you know just put a body cam on every cop and then basically instruct them to not hit people at all, right? Mm -hmm. Then to think about this like foreign yeah. thing that's going to happen to us in 50 years that it might just flood everything. Because, you know, I've never seen like mass destruction or the whole world going under, right? Which is basically what these people are saying. What the scientists are saying, right? So it, it kind of becomes this far away land, which I've never seen or... I, I'm only hearing stories, right? And I think yeah. that's really big issue, and and that's really hard to do anything about. Mm -hmm. Like, do 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 you know what I mean? I I, th I think you're absolutely right. Um, it's climate change has been described by a philosopher as a hyper object, and what, what I mean by a hyper object is it's an object that spans out over such a long period of time that it's you can't you can't understand it the same way you understand a normal object so can i get i give you an example yes uh, it's a funny story right about it, it's just a fictional story obviously but it's a man <laughs> who goes to oxford university right okay and then he he says to the person behind the counter oh can you please show me oxford university and so they take him on a tour. They show him, you know, the laboratories and they show him the, the seating rooms and the classrooms and everything. And then they come back to where they started and they were like, oh, so you happy now? And he's like, no, you didn't show me Oxford. You just showed me classrooms and seating rooms and toilets and hallways and benches, you know, because because the, the whole thing is difficult to wrap his head around. Right. Because we only experience a small part of climate change at a time. Yes. Right. Climate change is probably going to be like, let's say a five a 500 year phenomena from the very start of the industrial revolution until we fix it let's say that's 500 years right and then every single day is one tiny little slice of those 500 years well it's difficult it's 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 very difficult to to um to let's say deal with larger chunks than a couple of days or a couple of years or maybe in a couple of decades because dealing with politics that's going to span a hundred years is very, very, very difficult. 
And so when scientists say that like eventually 99% of all coral reefs are going to die out, that's so far in the future that it's impossible to wrap your head around. Yes. And and that's my point. It it, it basically becomes this yeah. like fairy tale land that you So yes, I, I agree been, with you absolutely. Right? I agree with you 100%. It becomes just the idea of Oxford when only you see the classrooms and the benches. Yes. So I, I agree with you absolutely there. Yeah. <sighs> you know, I, I, I kind of wonder what if this is like a turning point in history. You know what I mean? Like, you know, let's say a thousand years from now, if they're going to look back at us and think that we were stupid idiots for thinking that we could possibly impact the climate, right? Or that, you know, they're so, like, thankful that we actually did something, right? You know what I mean? Like, who who's going to be the winners, winners and losers of this? I don't think I understand quite what you mean. So you know, you know, let's say Tesla and Edison, right? Mm -hmm. Tesla was all about the alternating current, while Edison was all about the direct current, as as far as I know, at least. You know, when we look back on that fight, that battle, basically between those, if we're gonna put put it in those terms, we could basically say that oh, like. Tesla was basically right because, you know, that's what we use today. You know what I mean? That's the power we use. Yeah. And then Edison basically, I mean, I think it's Edison, <laughs> I'm not completely sure to be honest, that he basically became a loser, if you know what I mean. I mean, he's, he's not actually a loser, we still use dark current, but yeah. he basically oh, yeah. became a loser, okay, no, no, right? I think, I think I don't yes. So, like, yeah. so like I, in a thousand years from now, would, would mm -hmm. will climate activists be, be heroes or just, you know, a part of history that's yes. stupid? Yes. Uh, so you, you know those five stages that we discussed earlier? Yes. I want to propose a theory. Okay. Everyone in stage two thinks that the people in stage one are idiots. Everyone in stage three thinks that the people in stage one and two are idiots. Yes. Everyone in stage four thinks that, you know, and I, I, think, I think that's how it is. Like once you have, because, because if you don't know that you're right, it's difficult to behave as if you're right. But this is one of the few political cases where on the, I mean, obviously there, there can be disagreements on the, on the political side, but so if you want to like, you know, divide, divide climate change into two sides, the, the scientific side and the political side, right? On the scientific side, there isn't a discussion. It's an entirely done deal. And every, all the data that is ever going to come in is, is, is in like, uh, or not all the data, but all the, the theory uh, and the conclusions, the conclusions have been drawn. And so I think that as soon as someone reaches stage four, right, and they, they accept that something has to be done quickly, they have to think that the people in stage three are idiots, like I do currently, because not to sound braggy or anything, but I know I'm right. Okay. Because right now I can go on the on the IPCC's website and literally see them write that we have 10 years to decrease emissions by 60%. And there isn't anything that the people in stage 3, 2, or 1 can say to change that. So in the future, when hopefully, or like, okay, if there is a future that is, you know, <laughs> apocalyptic, right. yeah. everyone is probably going to be in stage 5 and there's going to be like there's going to be only buses and trains and probably no cars. And we're, you know, there's going to be like super expensive phones. So you only buy one every like five years. It's just, I don't know, dumb shit like that. Right. Everyone is going to look back and be like, because they know that they're right. Yes. And because they know that they, you know, save the world. Like we can look back and know that we were right to save the world from those um, carbon chloride gases ruining the ozone layer. Like we, we, we can look back and we, I'm, okay. I'm going to stop rambling now. I think that we're going to look back on climate change people the same way that we look back on the people who stopped using uh, carbon chloride gases to ruin the ozone layer. Simple as that. Right. You know, I, I, as is a thought that, you know, I think about quite often, you know what I mean? Like being on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. And I think... And I think... That... You know, okay, yeah, go on, please. No, no, you can say. It's fine. Right. And I, I just think that, you know, 
doing right this time is going to be way more important than getting the alternate current and direct current right. Mm -hmm. like, 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 that I know of, there's never been a more important decision, basically, for humans to make. Probably not. Probably not. You're right. And I think, you know, in, in my politics, right, there are, like, that's the, I, li I like the phrase, the right side of history. Some people don't like it, but I like it. Because yeah, me too. I think it's a very nice way to judge how certain you are of your positions. You know, on my, in, in my opinion, on a lot of topics, I'm not sure if I'm going to be on the right side of history. On some topics, I'm a little bit certain that I'm going to be on the right side of history. On some topics, I'm very certain. And on this topic, I'm dead sure. So I think, I <laughs> think the right side of history is a, it's, 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 a, it's, a very, it's a very good way of measuring it, right? Like, how certain are you that you are right? And this is one of the circumstances where you can say, I'm dead certain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, this has been a very, very interesting conversation. And I'm glad that you let me ramble so much or more about <laughs> things. I, I got to ramble so much. I hope uh, I didn't ruin the podcast for you. Dude, dude, you know, the more you talk, the less work I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. right, well, that's great. But uh, I think I have to wrap it up now. Dude, that, dude that's completely fine. I, I, I just want to thank you for uh, taking the time. Yeah, of course. It's fun. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, you know I, I hope it didn't burn you out and that you would come back sometime. No, no, this, <laughs> I, I think uh, I'll certainly be back sometime to ramble some more. I have way too many political opinions to just be sitting within my head. I gotta share them to random people. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, yeah, you know, thank you. And uh, I, I think that, you know, I'm starting to get tired as well, so I, it's it's a good time to leave it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, well, um, you know, I, I don't have any outro or anything, but I'm just gonna say, like, you know, see ya. <laughs> well, thank you so much, yeah.